All right, so let's pray. Lord, we thank you tonight for uh, just the opportunity to fellowship. It's just good to fellowship with the body and to be around one another and to encourage one another. Uh, so many of us are going through trials, various trials, fiery trials, and it's just so good to, to have uh, fellowship one with another and to pray with one another and to hug on one another and say, hey, it's good to see a brother or sister and to pray with one another. What a blessing that is. And it's just refreshing as well to come in into your house and to worship you and now to get into your word and have you speak to us. There's nothing better than that. So we ask, Holy Spirit, you would just drench us with your presence tonight. Drench us and feed us from your word. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. All of God's people said, amen. So we've entitled the book of Joshua, Conquer. And it's been said that the Christian life, though, is, is not a playground. It's a battlefield, and that's so true. So we are in a battle. Uh, but as I've said uh, with you many times before, we're not fighting for victory. We fight from victory. Uh, but there is this battle going on. Uh, Chrysostom wrote in the 4th century, quote, For the Christian, life involves challenge and conflict, whether we like it or not. And that's true because we're fighting a common enemy. In fact, three to be exact, all of us. We fight the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world is pulling us from the outside. Our flesh is pulling us from the inside. And the devil is using both of us to smash us, right, as best he can. And so we are in a warfare. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3 tells us that we are soldiers for Christ. In fact, one of the first hymns I ever learned was a hymn called Onward Christian Soldiers. I don't know if anybody remembers that song. Oh, look at that. So maybe it's been a while since you've sang it. So I'm going to just share a few of the verses and then the chorus. It says, like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided, all one body. We, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. Crowns and thrones may perish. Kingdoms rise and wane. But the church of Jesus Christ constant will remain. Gates of hell can never against the church prevail. We have Christ's own promise that cannot fail. Onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. So we are soldiers in the army of Christ. And so coming to Joshua chapter 6, we can relate to this because we're going to see some battles beginning to take place. In fact, as we come to this section, we come to the second division of the book. The first five chapters kind of deal with the preparation and entrance into the land. But in chapters 6 through 12, you now begin to have the conquest of the land as now they begin to go to battles. So tonight, we're going to try and get through the next three chapters. So we're going to do it. And we begin in chapter 6. We read, now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. So if you've been with us, of course, they've now crossed over. Remember, they crossed the Jordan last time, and it wasn't until their feet touched the water this time that God parted the waters. But now they're, they've entered into the land, and, and the people of the land have now heard of what's going on. They've heard of, of, of their conquering of the enemies on the other side of the Jordan. They've now heard of their miraculous entrance, and so they are securely shut up. No one's coming in, no one's going out. Now, Jericho, and I've been there, um, it, it was not a, an, an, an ex exceptionally huge city. Uh, approximately 9 to 10 acres is really the, the only area of the city. And, of course, there would have been people that lived a little on the outside, but that would have been the walls. Uh, but they did have two walls, uh, so, and they were 15 feet apart. So a large wall, then another gap, and another wall. And, of course, they would... Uh, in between, they had some homes. Of course, Rahab lived in, in that area on the wall. But it was formidable enough that when the spies first came 40 years earlier, they saw that and they were frightened by it. And so now here you have this city. It is shut up. And, and humanly speaking, to them, at least to the natural man at the time, it would seem hopeless. But, verse 2, the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king, and the mighty men of valor. Now, I love this because I love the past tense. God says, I have 
given it to you. From God's perspective, conquest already complete. Battle already won. The only issue is, would they walk by faith or not? Would they walk in obedience or not? And of course, we're going to see that they do. So God says, you've already won the battle. It's yours. I've given it to you. But you have to walk in obedience, and then you're going to experience victory. I've given it to you. And, and you know, of course, the same thing is for us. Again, as I just said, we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. Jesus has already gained, he's already beat the battle of sin, death, and the devil. He's fulfilled the law. He did it all at the cross. And he says, now that you're mine, you know, you're more than a conqueror. Tells us in Romans 8, 37, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Tells us in that same chapter, verse 31, if God is for us, who can possibly be against us? Man, that's a good word. I have victory in Christ. Uh, but like the Israelites, I have to walk by faith and I have to walk in obedience. And, and the problem is we, we often don't do that. We, we fail to follow through with God's battle plan, just following his orders. Um, J. Hudson Taylor, he was the founder of the uh, China In Inland Mission, uh, just went to China from uh, England, just did some amazing things. If you haven't read his biography, I highly recommend it. Uh, but he said this, there are three ways to serve the Lord. Three ways. One, to make the best plans we can and hope they succeed. Two, make our own plans and ask God to bless them. I think we do that one a lot. Or three, ask God for his plans and then do what he tells us to do. Well, that's really the only way. And, and to do it any other way, of course, is, is failure. We have to go by God's plan, do it his way, and then be obedient to that. So here's what God tells them to do. There's Jericho, it's shut up. And you, here's what you're going to do for victory. Verse 3, you shall march around the city, all you men of war, and you shall go all around the city once. Then you should do this uh, six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you'll march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, just, ah! And then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. So kind of an interesting plan, right? Pretty strange when you think about it. So you march around the city just once for six days. Nobody says anything. It's got to be quiet. But the priest will be blowing trumpets the whole time. And followed by the ark, which will march around as well. And then on the seventh day, he tells you you're going to march around seven times. And then the trumpets blast and everybody's going to yell, right? Ah, and the walls are going to come down. That just sounds pretty ridiculous, right? Sounds pretty foolish. I mean, if we were going to, if our troops were going out to battle against a country and, and we say, no, you don't need to bring the artillery, none of that stuff. Just, you guys just, would you just march around that city and uh, don't say anything? You know, we'd, everybody just think that's ridiculous, but God is in the business of doing things that confound the wise, it tells us in 1 Corinthians. Uh, we also read in Isaiah chapter 55, and verse 8, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways, the ways I do things, are not your ways. And why is that? For as, as, as the heavens are higher than the earth, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So God says, I, just, I, I like to do things my ways, and, and God uses unconventional means so that he can blow our minds and blow the minds of others. And everybody goes, wow, God is so creative, isn't he? He really is. So here's the great thing. Joshua obeyed. Okay. Joshua, the son of Nun, he called the priests together and said to him, verse 6, take up the Ark of the Covenant. Let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, proceed and march around the city and let him who is armed advance before the Ark of the Lord. So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew trumpets and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guards came after the ark while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say shout. Then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, go around it once. Then they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. 
And Joshua rose early in the morning. The priest took up the ark of the Lord and the seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them. But the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while the priest continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did six days. So this just went on six days straight. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day, marched around the city seven times in the same manner. And on that day only they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened when the priest blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. So God, Joshua said to do it, and, and they followed through. Now this, this was a whole event. This is a week-long event. And, and I, I just as I read through here, I mean, there's lots of thoughts that come to my mind. But um, to me, there were four tests that he was challenging them. The first one, I would say, would be faith. I mean, first of all, imagine being told you just march around these walls seven days and that's it. And they're going to fall. That sounds absolutely preposterous. It doesn't make any sense. So the only way they could possibly do this is say, okay, God, we believe you. We, we believe you're going to do it. Have, there's ne never been done it before in the past. So you have no gauge. So you're going to have to absolutely trust God. And isn't it true that God will ask you to do things that you haven't seen happen before? And, and, and God says that's what faith is. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Not seen. So it's been said that faith is not believing that God can. Faith is knowing that God will. That's faith. So they believed, okay, God, you will do this. We just believe it. So they had to honor God's word. It was definitely a test of faith. And God will test our faith. The second thing I see here is that it was a test of patience. I mean, it would have been very easy to say, we're wasting our time. I mean, day one, you do it. Day two, day three. I mean, you're like, really, God? We got all, the, we got all of our soldiers here. We're ready. We believe you. We're, we're going to take these people. Let's do it, man. And you know, you got a lot of pumped up guys. If you got a, a large army and they've had victories and they're now trusting God, I mean, they're pumped. They're psyched. And so that, let's do it, man, right? But it was a test of patience. And, and one of Israel's problems in the past had been impatience, going ahead of God. And of course, how many times have we done that in our life? So many times, I, I mean, I'm definitely, I've, I've stepped out and I do my thing and then I ask God to bless my mess. God bless this. I'm I just doing this thing, God. It's all for you. Really? Is it really for you, God, or is it, was it for me? So we need to be patient. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 12, it's a great verse. It says, through faith and patience, we inherit the promises of God. So first, they had to express faith, but they were also having to express patience. Another thing, I think a third test here, was that of self-control. I mean, here they have to march around. Think about the first six days they're marching around the walls where saying, they're saying nothing. Do you know how hard that is? Listen, some of you can hardly go six minutes without saying anything. <laughs> or six hours. Try six days. Just march around, just... Say nothing. Nothing. That's crazy. That's probably a good thing for us, you know, to practice that, right? Um, in James chapter 3, it, it tells us the, the boast, is, the, the tongue is a little member that boasts many things. In fact, James goes on to say that no man can tame the tongue, but God can. But God can. So this, this was definitely a, a test of self-control. And then I think one of the tests, it was a, it was a test of humility. I, I mean, first of all, they're having to march around the walls. They're, these are soldiers. They're ready to go to battle, and they have to march around and say nothing. And I'm thinking after the first day it happened, I'm sure the, the, the people in Jericho were watching what's going on, and they're thinking they were maybe a little worried at first. You know, they've seen these people. What, what's, what kind of magic's going to happen here? But after something doesn't happen the first day, the second day, the third day, I'm sure, and, and you've probably seen scenes of this, they probably started, started mocking the Israelites, for sure. 
Is this what you guys are going to do every day? March around the walls? Oh, I see all you got all your, your bows and arrows and your swords and everything, but you can't do anything with them. You guys aren't very fierce. I mean, this is a test of humility for these men to obey God and listen to the tauntings of this people out day after day after day. Ridicule. So God tested their faith, their patience, self-control, humility. So to think about this. this. These walls of Jericho were, were definitely an object lesson de designed by God to actually test his people and in the long run bring out the best in them and this is what I find that God does in our life God allows walls obstacles in our life difficulties and he does that because he's really wanting to bring the best out in us that that wall is a is a test of faith where am I gonna is this difficulty am I gonna trust God in this difficulty and am I going to trust him? Am I, am I going to exercise self-control? Am I going to be patient and let God work in his timing through this? And am I going to humble myself and trust in him? I mean, these are the qualities that God works out in our own Jerichos, in our own walls. And in the process, we end up having a greater faith, more patience, more self-control, a greater appreciation of God, definitely a greater amount of humility, humbled by how great God is. And so here, here you have these walls and this instruction by God, and, and the people follow through with it. Now look at verse 17. The city, God says, shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction. It and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all who are with her in her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. So Joshua is careful to remember, look at everybody in the city is going to be... Uh, you know, destroyed, except for Rahab and her family, because she had housed those two spies that had come back to her place back in chapter 2. He adds in verse 18, And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed, when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Man, he uses that word four times. What were the accursed things? Well, certainly it would have been the idols, don't take any of the idols. I mean, we've already mentioned that the people of Canaan were extremely idolatrous. They worshipped a, a, a multitude of various gods. And God says, you, won't, you don't bring these into the camp and defile me. You have no images before me. Not only that, he adds in verse 19, but all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron, these also, all these things are to be consecrated to the Lord. They need to come into the treasury of the Lord. Now, ordinarily, and we'll see this even later on, the spoils of the battle would be given to the people. They'd be divided amongst them. But not this time, not this first time, because this first victory would be a dedication to the Lord. The, as they, they gather this, uh, all the, the booty that it's taken, this is the first fruits of the land. And the first fruits would be dedicated to the Lord, set aside to him. Unfortunately, what we're going to see is that one man, just one man, decides not to do that. And as a result, brings disgrace and even defeat on Israel later. Well, day seven is verse 20. The people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the shout of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. That, may imagine, then the, the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man, woman, young, old, ox, sheep, donkey, with the edge of the sword. Now, you read that passage, if you just take your time to absorb what's there, that's pretty radical. And, and some people find it disturbing, to be honest with you, that God commanded all the inhabitants to be killed. And they'll say, well, isn't God a God of mercy and love? And yet here we have women and children killed. However, we've talked about this on numerous occasions, that the people of Canaan were, were horrifically wicked. Uh, they practice witchcraft, sorcery, which has to do with mind-altering uh, drugs and so forth. They perform ritual sacrifices with humans, even burnt their own children alive in soothsaying. We would also add that God did not bring judgment on these people right away. In fact, God actually gave these people centuries to repent. 
God patiently endured the sinfulness of Canaan all the way from the time of Abraham until the time of Joshua, some 400 years. At any time, these people could have repented of their sin. They had heard of the God of, of Abraham. Abraham walked throughout the promised land. So did Jacob. So did Isaac. They had heard of the God of Israel. They had even seen the mighty deeds that God had done in Egypt. In fact, Rahab's faith in God was the result of her hearing what God had done in Egypt. And because of that, she was saved. And so the Canaanites were not innocent victims. Warren Wearsby writes, ever wonder that God performed was a witness to the people of the land. But they preferred to go on in their sins and reject the mercy of God. Never think of the Canaanites as a helpless, ignorant people who knew nothing about the true God. Rather, they were willfully sinning against a flood of truth, end quote. And that's true. And so God was now using the Israelites as an instrument of judgment against those who had rejected God. And at the same time, then fulfilling them and bringing them back to the land of, of, of promise. By the way, when the children of Israel rebel against God, God will use a pagan nation, Babylon, as his instrument of righteousness to judge his people. So God will do that. And that's what he's doing here. So the people of the city were destroyed. Verse 22, but Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house and from there bring out the woman and all she has as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought Rahab, her father, mother, brothers, all that she had. So they brought out all of her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. So one of the things we want to see here is definitely in the midst of judgment, there was grace. There's always grace in the midst of judgment. Always, 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 always. And, and this woman had placed her faith in God and she was spared, as well as her family who had placed their faith in God. Now, you might say, um, how, how did they place their faith in God? Where do we see that? Well, the very fact that they went to Rahab's house. The very fact that her family came into her house is an expression of their faith because her relatives could have said, we don't believe you. Are you kidding me? We're not going to go in your house. There ain't judgment coming here. Forget that. We don't believe in the God of Israelites. We believe in our, our gods, our idols. They could have chosen to do that, but they didn't. Rather, they forsook their idols and everything else, and they came and they dwelt with Rahab. So it demonstrates the fact that they had placed their faith in God as well. And so Rahab and her family were actually saved, were set aside and, and redeemed. But they burnt the city, verse 24, and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua spared Rahab, the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had, so she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. And so again, uh, you see the grace of God. Interesting how it mentions her every single time. She's a harlot, she's a harlot. I mean, it, it, you say, well, gosh, wow. It, why does it do that? Because it's wanting to point out how gracious God was. I mean, and, and think about this. God honors her later. I mean, here she is. She's a, a Gentile woman who worshiped pagan God, sold her body for money, yet through her faith in God, God honors her, and she's actually mentioned in the messianic line of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in Matthew chapter 1. Well, verse 26, Joshua then charged them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds this city, Jericho. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn, and with his youngest he shall set up its gates. In other words, anybody who raises up this city again, is, it's going to be at a high cost. And that's exactly what happened. Because actually we read that it was raised up again. We find this in 1 Kings chapter 16. In verse 34 specifically, it says, In the days of King Ahab, Hiel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation with, with Abraham, his firstborn, and his youngest son, he set up its gates, according to the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua. So it was raised up again, but at the cost of two of his sons. God always fulfills his word. So the Lord was with Joshua, verse 17. His fame spread throughout all the country. But, chapter 7, the children of Israel committed a trespass. 
regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. By the way, notice right off the bat, it says the children of Israel committed a trespass. Notice, wait a second, I mean, there's one man. One man committed the sin, Achan. But notice, in the eyes of God, the children of Israel, all of them did, because God considered his people not an assortment of clans or tribes, but as his people singularly. And so one man's sin is going to affect the whole body. And this is what we read in 1 Corinthians. When Paul talks about the church of Jesus Christ as being the body of Christ, he says, when one member suffers, so all the members suffer. But when one member is honored, so the whole body is honored. So problem number one, we've got sin in the camp. There's a guy by the name of Achan, and he took some of the spoil from Jericho. They weren't supposed to take anything, right? But there's a second problem. Verse 2, now Joshua sent from Jericho to Ai. He, says he sent some men to the next city to conquer it, which is besides beth Aven. It's on the east side of Bethel. And he spoke to them saying, go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, oh, do not let all the people go up. But let about eh, two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So it was a second problem. You have Achan who's taken some stuff. And now in this second conquest in the next city, you have self-confidence. The city of Ai was much smaller than Jericho. So the spies come back to Joshua and say, oh, man, you don't need to send up all the guys on this one. Just, you know, a couple thousand, maybe two or three. Don't need to weary the people. Problem. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12 says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. The Bible talks about in Proverbs in several places. For example, in Proverbs 16, 18, that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So the, there, was, there was pride here. And then there was another problem. In verse 4, we, say, we read, So... 3,000 men went up from there to the people, but they fled before the people of God. So, so in other words, Joshua, so he asked for 3,000, and, and Joshua sent him. You say, what's the third problem? The problem is this. Joshua never consulted God, never prayed to God. He simply accepted the counsel of these men, and, and he sent him. And, and the results are tragic. I mean, think about this. Had Joshua, as he should have, had Joshua prayed, or got, gathered some of the leaders. So let's have a prayer meeting. Number one, God would have informed him, hold on a second, don't go to the next battle. You've got problems here after Jericho. You've got a guy in the camp who's in sin. He's taking stuff. Number two, you've got some of the guys that are kind of proud. They're thinking of just taking a few. That might not be my game plan. And number three, let me give you the game plan. But instead, off they go. And, and they didn't consult God, and the results are staggering. Oh, what peace we often forfeit, all because we do not carry everything to the Lord in prayer, right? You know that hymn? It's an old hymn night. How about that? But think about this. This same thing can happen with us. If we don't pray, if we're not seeking to hear God reading his word, if we're not taking all things to him, we can fall into this same trap. Oh, I got this one, God. I, I, I don't need to pray about this. This seems so obvious, so easy, and, and we, we make so many mistakes. The results here were disastrous. Look at verse 5. The men of Ai struck down 36 men, for they chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. So 36 men lost their lives because Joshua didn't pray, because Achan's in sin, because the men are proud, they don't pray. And I find it interesting. Early on, remember in chapter 2 when the spies met with Rahab? Rahab said, man, man you guys are going to take over the land because the hearts of the people are melting because of the great things they're hearing. But it's interesting. Now we hear the hearts of the Israelites melting. Why? Well, because of the very first time they realized that defeat is possible in the land of victory. Defeat is possible in the land of victory. 
Why? Because you're not walking in obedience to God. You can be in the land of victory. You can be a born-again believer and think, man, Jesus is so good. I'm, I'm fighting for victory. It's all good. But if I'm not walking in obedience to God, I'm not going to experience that victory. And that's exactly what they're realizing for the very first time. They forsook God's plan, and it was disastrous. Now, notice Joshua's response. Joshua tore his clothes. He fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel along with him, and they, they put dust on their heads. I mean, they were, this, is a, this is a position of brokenness, right? And that's a good place to be. The problem is, so the posture was right. The problem was the attitude. Because notice what Joshua says. He says, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us to the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh my goodness, Joshua now sounds like the children of Israel did 40 years ago. When they came to Kadesh Barnea, they said, Oh, why, God, have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? That's exactly what Joshua's doing. Oh, notice what he says. He says, Oh, that we had been content to dwell on the other side of the Jordan. Oh my goodness. Uh, wait, wait, what a mistake. It was a mistake for us to cross miraculously over the Jordan. Really? He says, oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? In other words, God, you're in trouble. You, you, got, a, you, got, a, you got a PR problem, God, man. People are going to hear about this, and you've been defeated, man. Are you kidding me, Joshua? So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Man, Joshua's in trouble, man. <laughs> right? You know, dad can be, right? That's, that's dad. Oh, dude, you're going to get it. Israel has sinned. And they have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived. And they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies. Because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the cursed from among you. So, Joshua, here's the problem. You've got sin in the camp. And you need to take care of it immediately or you will not have another victory. Now, again, notice that God doesn't say one man has sinned, but all Israel has sinned. You've sinned. Israel's doomed. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6, don't you know that just a little leaven leavens the whole lump? In other words, if, if a small amount of sin is tolerated or allowed, and God knows this, of course, that it'll infect the whole body, all of the people. So it has to be dealt with. You have to remove the sin. So he says, verse 13, get up, sanctify the people, and say, sanctify yourselves tomorrow, because thus says the Lord of Israel, there's an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the cursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to the families. And then the family which the Lord takes shall come by the households. And then the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. So in other words, we'll go from tribe to, to clan to family to household to individual. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he's done a disgraceful thing in Israel. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribe. So God was very methodical. First, he has the 12 tribes. Each tribe just passes before Joshua. And then we're going to go right down through clan and then to household and then to individual. Now, how they did it, we are not told here. Uh, most suggest, and most likely this is the way it was, is the high priest was there, and most likely they consulted the Urim and the Thummim. Remember the white stone, black stone, and this is how God ascertained, or, or Joshua did through the priest from God, as to which tribe, which household, and so forth. Uh, verse 16 says, the tribe of Judah was taken. So first it comes to the tribe of Judah. Then he brought the clan of Judah, and he took the family of the Zarathites. Then he brought the family of the Zarathites, man by man, and Zabdi was taken. Then he brought his household, man by man, and Achan, verse 18, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Imagine, just imagine this. One guy did it, and you have this whole tribe. There's like two and a half million people. Are you kidding me? I mean, you're thinking this is like a needle in a haystack. 
And you, the, he's probably thinking, yeah, right, I, I, I'm going to get away with this one, man. Um, Numbers 32, 23 tells us, be sure your sin will find you out. Wow. God knows everything. And this is something we need to take to heart. Um, Galatians 6, 7, God says, don't be deceived. Whatever man sows, that will he reap. I, I'm certain Achan thought he got away with it. But now he's about to reap the fruit of what he had sown. He, he, soon he would be living up to his name, Achan. He's, soon he's going to be Achan, I guarantee you that. Um, but his, his real name actually means trouble. But this is what he caused Israel. He brought trouble upon the tribe. I mean, 36 men lost their lives be, because of him. Which demonstrates the fact as well that no one sins to themselves, right? I mean, Achan probably thought, look, not only am I going to get away with it, what does it matter? I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not affecting anybody by what I'm, I mean, it's just I'm doing it myself. Hey, man, I'm not hurting anyone. And, and that's the lie that the, the devil will say to us when we sin. I'm not hurting anyone. I'm not making other people partake in my activity. But our sin always affects other people. If you're sinning and you're married, you're going to affect your spouse. That's going to affect your children. When we sin, that affects our coworkers. When we sin, that affects people around us. So sin is like the proverbial pebble that's been dropped in the, the water that's concentric circles move ever outward, right? It, it moves ever outward. So Achan thought, I'm not going to hurt anybody. My sin's not going to do anything. And 36 people are killed. So we can never underestimate the effect of one sin. I mean, if, if there was one sin, Jesus would have died on the cross for that one sin. Of course, there's more than that. But the damage of one sin. I mean, think about this. Uh, Jonah, when he refused to obey God, he almost sunk a whole ship. And they had to throw him overboard or they would have all drowned. I, I think of David's sin. In, in 2 Samuel chapter 24, it tells us that David took a census that he wasn't supposed to do. And 70,000 people lost their lives. One person's sin can affect many. And that's what we have happening here. So verse 19, now Joshua said to Achan, my son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, indeed, I've sinned against the Lord God of Israel and this is what I've done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and I took them. And there they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver underneath it. So first of all, Achan confesses, but he also knew he was wrong. Why? Because he hid it. Listen, anytime you have to hide something, you know you're wrong. That's a pretty good way to think about it. If you got to hide it, it's wrong, right? Why are you hiding it? Because you know it's wrong. Jeremiah Burroughs once said, take heed of secret sin. They will undo you if loved and maintained. One moth can spoil a garment. One leak can drown a ship. True. We've got to be careful of those sins. Now, as I look at this, though, I see that Achan's sin kind of, it, 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 there were really three stages to it. Notice he, he, when he gives his explanation in verse 21, first of all, he says, I saw. So his, his first problem is that he longed for something. It wasn't wrong to see it. I mean, he saw it there. He, he saw spoils all around. But it was the second look. It was the look of, of uh, you know, of lust, of saying, I got to have that, Right? It's the lust of the eyes. I got to have that. He saw it. I got to have that. And then the second step into his sin is also in verse 21. He says, I saw. And then he says, I coveted. The word covet means to crave for intensely. So it, it is this look that just moved into a, a lust, right? So you first have these lust of the eyes and then this lust of the flesh. And then it says, Achan took it. So I looked, I coveted, but then the final step was I, I took it. And, and, and this is pride. I just took it. I don't, I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care what God thinks. I don't care that they said don't take it. I'm going to do it. And this is what 1 John 2.16 tells us. It says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes... And the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's worldly. 
And that's a worldly response. And look at how it affects you. He will lose his life as a result. Joshua sent men, messengers. They ran to the tent. And there they were, just as he said, hidden in the tent, silver underneath it. And they took from, from the midst of the tent and they brought them to Joshua. See, here it is, exactly as he said. He took it. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, son of Zerai, the silver, a garment, wedge of gold, his sons, daughters, ox and donkey, sheep, tent, all that he had brought them to the valley of Achar. Joshua said, why have you troubled us? And again, that's what his name means, trouble. The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones and they burned him with fire after they'd stoned him with stones. What a radical thing. And it tells us they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there this day, so the Lord turned from the fierceness of anger. So in other words, once the sin was taken care of, God would work through them. And the name of the place has been called the Valley of Achor, which literally means the Valley of Trouble to this day. Okay, I'm going to do chapter 8. I know I'm going long. Sorry about that. Now the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise. Go to, up to Ai. See, I have given you the hand of the king of Ai, his people, city, and his land. So once the sin is removed, they could take it. By the way, it's the same with us. Once we deal with sin, we have victory, right? Once we deal with sin, we can have victory. And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its cattle you should take as booty for yourselves. So this time, you can keep the spoils. Lay an ambush for the city behind it. So Joshua rose and all the people of war to go up to against Ai. Joshua chose uh, 30,000 men of valor and sent them away by night. Notice God gave Joshua, Joshua the game plan. So don't do as you think. I want you to ambush the city. And uh, here's the thing. For the first time, well, think about this. He's taking 30,000. He's taking 10 times more men than he took the last time. So this time he's not relying on just like, yeah, just send up 3,000. No, this time he's going to do it the way God wants. So he commanded them saying, behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city behind the city. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you be ready. Then I and all the people who are with me will approach the city and will come out about when they come out against us as at first, then we'll flee before them. So we're going to come out to the, to the, against the city and then we're going to run away like, oh, we're running like last time. Then they'll come out after us till we've drawn them away from the city for they will say they're fleeing as uh, the first. Therefore, we'll flee before them. Then you shall rise from the ambush and seize the city for the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. And it'll be when you've taken the city that you shall set the city on fire according to the commandment of the Lord you shall do. See, I've commanded you. Joshua therefore uh, sent them out and they went to lie in ambush and stayed between Bethel and Ai on the west side of Ai. But Joshua laws that night among the people. I, I do just want to make note of that, that uh, Joshua was, you know, he's 80 years old now. He's an older man, but he was still battle ready and I love the fact that he slept with the troops this first night to kind of encourage them and to be with them and say hey we're gonna I'm gonna be in this battle with you God's gonna be faithful then Joshua rose early in the morning and mustered the people and went up he and the elders of Israel before the people of Ai and all the people of war who were with them went up and drew near and they came before the city and camped on the north side of Ai now a valley lay between them and Ai so he took about 5,000 men and sent them in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side of the city. And when they had set the people, all the army that was on the north of the city and its rear guard on the west of the city, Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley. And it happened when the king of Ai saw it that the men of the city hurried and rose early and went out against uh, went out against Israel to battle. He and all of his people at an appointed place before the plain. But he did not know there was an ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before and fled by the way of the wilderness. So all the people in Ai were called together to pursue him. And they pursued Joshua and were drawn from the city. So this is a great strategy. They just think Israel, a bunch of wimps, they're fleeing as before. We're going to take them, you know. And so everyone now clears the city to come after them. There was not a man left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel. So they left the city open and pursued Israel. Then the Lord said to Joshua, stretch out your spear that's in your hand toward Ai, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stre uh, stretched out the spear that was in his hand toward the city. So those in ambush arose quickly out of their place. They ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand, and they entered the city, took it, and burned, and hurried to set the city on fire. 
And when the many of Ai looked behind them, they saw and behold, the smoke of the city ascended to heaven. So they had no power to flee this way or that way. And the people who had fled to the wilderness turned back on the pursuers. Now when Joshua and all the people saw the ambush had been taken in the city and that the smoke of the city ascended, they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. Then the others came out of the city against them, so they were caught in the midst of Israel, some on this side, some on that side, and they struck them down, so they let none of them remain or escape. So it was a brilliant plan. It was a great victory. But the king of Ai, they took alive and brought him to Joshua. And it came to pass when the Israel had made an end of slaying all the inhabitants of Ai in the field and in the wilderness where they pursued them, and when they had fallen by the edge of the sword until they were consumed, and so again, all the soldiers, every one killed in the field, that all the Israelites returned to Ai, struck it with the edge of the sword. So it was when all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai, none remained. For Joshua did not draw back his hand, with which he stretched out his spear until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai, only the livestock The spoil of the city, Israel took as booty for themselves according to the word of the Lord, which he had commanded Joshua. So again, this time they were able to keep the spoil. So Joshua burned Ai and made made it a heap forever, a desolation to this day. Now, the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until evening. And as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his corpse down from the tree, cast it at the entrance of the gate of the city, and raise over it a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Now, just something interesting right here. Um, so far in, in Israel, are coming into the promised land, the children of Israel have erected four heaps of stones, four of them. Do you remember one heap of stones in the Jordan? Another heap of stones, stones taken out of the Jordan set at Gilgal as a reminder of God's faithfulness. The third heap of stones we saw was over Achan, right, in the valley of Achor, a reminder of what sin will do. And, and now this fourth heap of stones over the king of Ai, a reminder of what obedience will do. So you have, you know, stones reminding of God's faithfulness, stones reminding of a sin, stones reminding them of faithfulness or obedience. And then we read, now Joshua built an altar to the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebel. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man has wielded an iron tool. In other words, they don't make a fancy thing, just a pile of stones. And they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And there in the presence of the children of Israel, they wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. Then all Israel with their elders, officers, judges stood on either side of the ark before the priests, Levites, who bore the ark of the coming of the Lord. The stranger, as well as he was born among them, half of them were in front of Mount Gerizim, half of them in front of Mount Ebal. Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded them there that they should bless the people of Israel. So this, again, is a fulfillment, something we saw earlier in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28. God told them, when you come into the land of promise, half the tribes will be on this mountain, half the tribes will be on this mountain, half on Ebal, half on Gerizim. And the priests will then read the law, and, and over Mount Gerizim, they're going to share all of the, the blessings. And then all the people in this mountain will say, Amen, Amen, Amen. And then likewise, on the other mountain, he's going to go through all the lists of all the curses. And everybody over there says, has to say, Amen, 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 and so forth. And, and then there was an altar. And by the way, you'll notice that the altar was on Mount Ebal. That's the mountain of cursing. Because their sin had to be atoned for, Right? And afterward, he read all, check this out, he read all the words of the law, the blessings, the cursings, according to the, all that was written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before the assembly of Israel, with the women, the little ones, the strangers were among, among them. So check this out. This is not like an hour reading. This is like a four to eight hour reading. All the law, men, women, children, everybody's there and they have to correspond and so forth. I mean, talk about, I mean, it's hard to go through a whole night of a a study, right? An hour, I get it. You're like, hurry up, dude, get done. Uh, These guys went a long time. But the issue was that they would hear the word of God. They were reinstating the covenant with God. They had had victory, they had had failure, and now they had recognized we're gonna have victory only when we obey God. And so now they were being reminded, we're re- re- reestablishing the covenant with God. 
And so God would be faithful. But it wasn't enough just to you know, hear the law read to them. They had to correspond, amen, amen. And then even more than that, they had to do it. And I, I think of James 1 and 22, it tells us that we need to be doers of the word, not hearers only. So here we are. Let's close with the words of A.W. Tozer. He had some good words on this. He said, none of us can ever be fully pleasing to God if we're not willing to be well taught his word and live it. God's word are not for me to edit. God's words for me are not to tinker with, but to believe and obey, period. And so let's, let's do that. Let's remember God has been faithful. Let's remember what sin does, but let's also remember what faithfulness and obedience does. And let's live it. Let's do it. Amen? Let's pray.